and welcome to Fez Physics, coming to you from an oasis of sanity and safety in the post-industrial pre-apocalyptic northeast of England. I'm Bernard Taylor, that's me, and let's get going looking at some more complex issues that arise with questions on projectile motion. Remember that we ignore air resistance in calculations, and we'll cover that in a few moments. We treat horizontal velocity and vertical velocity independently. The horizontal velocity is constant. And of course, the vertical velocity changes because of the acceleration due to gravity. Prosecco bottles can be opened carefully by covering with a tea towel and working the, course loose, working the cork loose, or they can be opened by firing the cork into the air. It seems a real waste to shake the bottle and then fire the cork. You'd lose too much good wine. So here, if the cork is fired from ground level with a speed of 15 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal, determine the vertical component of the velocity. Okay, well, a diagram is always helpful. And here we can see the vertical component is 15, 15 times the cosine of the angle that we move through, which is the sine of the other angle. So 15 sine 30, which equals 7.5 meters per second. We're here now as to determine the time taken for the cork to reach the maximum height and the total time of flight. Well, we've got the initial vertical velocity and when it reaches its maximum height, the final vertical velocity would be zero. V equals U plus AT. A is minus 9.81. So that time to go up to its highest point is 0.76. Let's double that to find the total time of flight. And we get 1.5 seconds. What is the horizontal component of the velocity? Well, it's 15 times the cosine of the angle that we move through to go horizontally. And so that's 15 times cos 30, which is about 13 meters per second. What's the range? The horizontal distance traveled. Well, let's remember horizontally, there's no acceleration or deceleration, just a constant velocity, as we said before, ignoring air resistance. Velocity is distance over time, distance is velocity times time, horizontal component of the velocity times the total time, and that gives us 19.5 meters. Let's call it 20 meters. Now, the atlatl, is a device for throwing a flexible dart a considerable distance through the air with relative ease. Devices like these were one of the weapons used by the Aztecs against the Spanish conquistador. Um, they can be found in other cultures, um, e.g. the Woomera, uh, used by Aboriginal peoples of Australia. And this YouTube video Weapon Masters, Atlatl versus Steel Armor. It's great fun, and you do get to meet Atlatl Bob, one of the legends in the Atlatl throwing community. Throwers made of bone appear very early in the archaeological record. And of course, bone survives, but wooden darts generally don't. Dog ball launchers or dog throwers, as I sometimes call them, um, use a similar kind of effect. And French arrows are interesting. French arrows involve um, a, 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 an arrow with a, a slot in it, a cut in it, um, and you throw the arrow with a bit of string, and lots of fun. They use a notch in the arrow and a length of string to propel 
the arrow. Now, here you see my atlatl. Uh, the end of the dart, the end of the dart here is hollowed out so that the end of the screw fits onto it, but different designs are possible. Interestingly, we might ask ourselves, why is the stone taped to the thrower? And here we see the stone, <coughs> excuse me, taped to the thrower. Well, it acts as a counterbalance to the weight of the dart and makes it easier to hold. If we think about the principle of moments, my hand is a pivot or fulcrum, essentially. We have the weight of the stone acting vertically downwards, this distance from the pivot, and that counterbalances the weight the smaller weight of the dart, which acts perhaps about here, this distance from the pivot. And if you do get to try making your own atlatls, of course, be safe and sensible and make sure that nobody at all is in the way. Nobody, including dogs, seagulls, or other animals. Here, the total time of flight for an atlatl dart was three seconds. Assuming that the flight of the dart was symmetrical, show that the initial vertical component of the velocity was about 15 meters per second. Well, the time taken to reach the max maximum height is 1.5 seconds. That's half the total time of flight. Using V equals U plus AT, vertically, getting to the highest point again, that final vertical velocity is zero. So zero equals UY minus 9.81, times 1.5 and that gives us an answer of 14.7 ms to the minus one about 15 meters per second if the dart was fired at 40 degrees to the horizontal determine the velocity at which it left the thrower again it's always helpful to draw little sketch diagrams in lots of physics problems. We know that the vertical component is 14.7, but what is U? Well, U times sine 40, that's the vertical component, is 14.7. So then a little bit of mathematical jiggery-pokery gives us U as 22.9, 23 meters per second. We're asked to calculate the theoretical range. Of course, horizontal motion, the velocity is constant, and distance equals velocity times time. So we have the horizontal component velocity times the total time, and again, Quick calculation gives us 53 meters. Why is the actual range likely to be less than the theoretical range calculated? Well, don't just say air resistance. We would say air resistance provides a force which reduces the horizontal component of the velocity, and this will reduce the range from the theoretical value of 53 meters. You've got to be a little bit smarter, a little bit cleverer at A level and at IB level in, in providing these kind of answers. We could have also said air resistance provides a force which dissipates the kinetic energy of the dart. And 
Just before we move on, remember with an atlatl, you can throw the dart or spear much further than you can by hand. With the throwing stick, you're applying a force over a greater distance, over a greater time, which gives more kinetic energy to the dart, which reaches a greater velocity and will therefore travel further. Now, Lewis Fry Richardson was one of the first people to use uh, modeling techniques to forecast the weather. He developed a method for measuring wind speed, which involves shooting metal spheres vertically upwards. And of course, what goes up must come down. He and his colleagues stood in a shelter underneath a protective metal uh, screen and fired the gun upwards through a hole in the roof. And you can see the photograph here uh, from Local Heroes by Adam Hart Davis. I try to recreate this experiment in, in using a small compressed air rocket fired vertically upwards close to the end of a school building and filming the result. Um, I use tracker software to measure the vertical height and the time. Even so, I've got to admit that this was a difficult experiment to carry out and involved eventually the uh, estimation of some of these values. The graph coming up shows how the height of the compressed air rocket varied with time. You might find it useful to print out this graph uh, to use it to answer some of the questions. So here's my graph of height plotted against time for a compressed air rocket. Okay, now before we move on, notice we, we need, we're going to need some kind of estimate of the maximum height. We're also going to need a calculation of the initial velocity. And of course, that would involve the gradient of this part, this first part of the graph. So let's look at these questions. Use the graph to estimate the maximum height reached. And from the graph, it's about 22.4 meters. To determine for part two, the, gra the, the initial velocity of the rocket, yeah, it's the gradient, which is about 40 meters per second. And here, we're asked to calculate the maximum theoretical height reached using this initial velocity and assuming a constant deceleration of 9.81 ms to the minus two. So my hint is again going up and reaching its maximum height, what's the final velocity? Well, v squared equals u squared plus 2as, final vertical velocity is zero, we know the initial vertical velocity and a calculation gives us a massive 81.6 meters, which is quite surprising. Why didn't the rocket reach this maximum height? Again, don't just say air resistance, be a bit smarter. Air resistance provides a force causing deceleration and reducing the vertical velocity. The next part, the rocket landed 15 meters from the launch point. Use information from the graph to estimate the velocity of the wind. Well, from the graph, the time of flight is about 2.2 seconds. The range, the horizontal distance is about 15 meters. Go back to the graph if you need to. The horizontal speed is 15 meters over 2.2 seconds, which is 6.8 ms to the minus one. But of course, we are assuming that the rocket moves horizontally at the same speed as the wind. This is an assumption. Cricket, a great game. Well, for some people. While playing cricket, the ball is struck and moves at a velocity of 10 meters per second at an angle of 40 degrees to the horizontal. The ball is in the air 
for a total of 1.4 seconds. What's the vertical component of the velocity? Remember, it's 10 times the cosine of the angle that we move through, which is the sine of the other angle. So resolving vertically, 10 times sine 40, 6.43 ms to the minus one. Um, we could round that to 6.4. What is the height above the ground, the height edge at which the ball is struck? Let's consider vertical motion. Vertically, h equals the initial vertical velocity times the total time of flight plus a half times minus 9.81, of course, times the total uh, time squared. And this gives us h is minus 0 0.61 meters. In other words, from the starting point, the resultant displacement is 6.61 meters that way. So h is 6.0.61 meters. What's the range of the cricket ball? Horizontal velocity is constant. Range, is, which is the distance, is velocity times time. So we get the horizontal component of the velocity times the total time. And that gives us 10.73 meters. So let's round that to 10.7 meters. Not too many significant figures. Now, let's think about this. The initial vertical velocity is 6.43 meters. And the velocity at A, by reasons of symmetry, would also be 6.43 meters per second. We've got the height above the ground where the ball is struck. And what I'm asking is, yeah, we know that the ball will drop a little bit further. Now, bear with me here. What I'm going to do is not immediately obvious, but could come up in a more complex question. I'm asking, what is the velocity at B after the ball has fallen a further 0 0.61 meters? Now, hold on, there's something wrong here. The ball won't strike the ground here. Of course, it will strike it somewhere here. But bear with me, what's the vertical velocity at this level, at the level of the ground? Again, v squared equals u squared plus 2as, putting in the numbers, and I get that v is 7.3 ms to the minus one. Okay. What time does the ball take in moving from level A to level B? V equals U plus AT. V, the final velocity vertically, 7.3. We've just worked that out. The initial vertical velocity, 6.43. It's going down. So A, the acceleration, is plus 9.81. And that gives us a time of 0 0.089 seconds. Okay. Now, the horizontal velocity, the horizontal velocity is constant, and that's 7.66 meters per second. So at the point of impact at B, remember our V is really somewhere here where my laser pointer is. So we've got a horizontal velocity that way, we've got a vertical velocity that way, and we could quite easily work out what the resultant velocity was, r, and at what angle to the vertical or indeed to the horizontal it would be. And to my mind, this would form a more complex question with more points at stake. 
Now, we're almost finished, and I'm going to suggest to you that you might like to read through this extra bit of reading about the atlatl. -atl. The atlatl -atl -atl dart is actually flexible, so have a look at this, read it through, and this was Fez Physics. Keep working, and please, whatever you're doing, remember to go back to past exam questions. Past exam questions are the key to your success in physics exams. So thank you for watching and goodbye for now.